Tony, I think we've been threatening to do something like this for a while. <laughs> we um, have. So welcome to the Change Society podcast. Thank How you. are you doing today? I'm doing really well. Thank you. Uh, good to be here. Great. Well, as you know, we, we like to do um, lots of events and pre-COVID this uh, bar and event area was absolutely packed. And I, I remember one of our most successful ones pre-COVID was uh, the one that you kindly um, led for us, which was entitled The Dark Arts of Change. So yeah. we're going to be talking about that today. But before we get cracking, um, it'd be good for you to introduce yourself, um, sort of, yeah, who you are, what you do and something about you. So, um, yeah, Tony, um, I'm, I'm a CIO for for the asset finance business at Close Brothers, a merchant bank, uh, been about 20 or so years in uh, various uh, kind of uh, tech and change roles across media, telco, insurance, and now banking. Um, I graduated in uh, politics and French, so how I ended up being a CIO is slightly beyond me. <laughs> um, but, you know, outside of work, I'm a, I'm a runner, a cyclist, you know, very much a kind of middle-aged mammal. I guess that's me. Cool. So, the dark arts of change. <laughs> what are we talking about today? Because it's a very, very intriguing title. Yes. Um, I think it might be a little bit of a misnomer, the dark arts of change. It's more the, the true arts of change. Um, I think, um, you know, I, f- I felt for a long time that, that often as uh, change and technical and professionals, we talk about... The tools we use, we talk about you know agile, we talk about AI, we talk about you know various methodologies, and um, it's as though we've we've allowed ourselves to believe that we've created the idea of leadership and change in the last twenty years or so, when of course we haven't. You know, change and good leadership has been around for thousands of years, and I guess my contention is that um, you know what made Julius Caesar a great leader. Um, is what makes a great change leader and a great leader now. Nothing's changed, humanity hasn't changed. Yeah, the tools have, but not the essentials. And I think when I talk about the dark arts of change, I guess what we're talking about is really looking at the true arts is you know, what makes a good change leader. And my contention is it hasn't changed in thousands of years. So we're saying that technology and tools are, are just hype? Um, not just hype, I think, you know, the the world of technology is moving fast and has you know moved incredibly fast particularly in the last 20 years and i think you know we cannot pretend that they are vital now and will become increasingly vital in the future and but my contention is that in driving that change and making use of the technology what we need to draw on is the real skills of leadership and how you lead a technology program is how you led um, a Roman army. It's how um, Abraham Lincoln led in the American Civil War. It's how the great um, kings of the Middle Ages led. It, there is no difference in those principles. The fundamentals of leadership have not changed. And I think where we make a mistake is that we train our people and ourselves. We emphasize the tools rather than the fundamental um, building blocks and skills of leadership. And by those skills, I mean the ability to set a vision, the ability to understand where power lies and how to wield power, um, how to compromise, which is an incredibly important thing. We all do that every day. Um, and how to properly understand risk, which, again, we talk about risk in a quite a technical way, but you know, risk is something which has existed forever. You know, Again, going back to Julius Caesar, when he made the decision to march his troops back to Rome, he took a real risk. You know, the risk was he would die, he would be killed for this. And that ability to understand true risk is something which I think sometimes we've lost a little bit. That's very interesting. So it's kind of a contrarian view, I suppose, is um, we're talking about the strengths of the leader really hasn't changed in the last sort of two, three thousand years. And albeit a lot of content coming through now is to be a successful leader in this decade you need these types of skills you need these types of new skills but what we're saying is actually they're the same skills as they've always been no absolutely I, I i see exactly the same thing as you do you know there's there's white paper after white paper and things popping up in my inbox telling me you know the skills of a digital leader you know and the contention is that the digital world has meant you need new skills and okay yes you know you need to understand data in a way you didn't before you need to understand you know and the web, you need to understand um, all sorts of technology. But in order to actually be successful and um, to implement something, the way you do that has not changed. 
at all in my contention. And I, you know, draw on loads of um, examples in history from, you know, we mentioned Abraham Lincoln, we mentioned um, a Julius Caesar, but if you look at kind of Eisenhower in the Second World War, you look at um, Churchill, of course, you look at um, um, Eleanor Aquitaine, all these historical figures. And actually, when you read about them, the skills that they deployed and the tools that they deployed in order to achieve their goals are all fundamentally the same. And I look at myself and my day-to-day -day job and say, well, what actually do I spend my time doing? I don't spend my time talking in detail about Agile or um, running Kanban boards, etc. I spend my time persuading people, setting a vision, um, understanding um, people's fears, understanding people's risk profile, um, understanding where power lies in a business so I can align to it and actually get things done. And those, those when I read history, those are fundamentally what has happened, frankly, forever. So power, understanding where the power is, having the courage to set a vision and, and, and take a group of people there to, to the execution. Yeah. So do you, do you think we've lost our way a bit then in recent times? So if I said it in the context of corporate setting of yeah. course uh, most of our listeners are leading uh, businesses or, or leading divisions or, or le leading organizations in a business setting why has it got so hard over the last 10 to 15 years so if we look at several stats that are out there at the moment ones that people have all heard about before I think um, when I could see a problem um, before I set this business up you know the, the stat was got a 70 percent of change initiatives were failing Recent stats are now saying 84, 85% of change and transformation is failing. And then you look at some of the research that's been done over in the US. Uh, Fast Company did a, a recent study, and I'll put all of this stuff in the, in the show notes, around £910 billion pounds was wasted on digital change wow. alone in the US. Why is it getting so hard? And, and why is we as leaders not able to... Um, deliver some of this change or, 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 or you know, this seismic change that's, that's coming across the whole corporate uh, sphere currently? You know, wh wh why do you think we've made it so difficult? What do you think's missing? And what can we learn from previous yeah. leaders that we could maybe just get back to basics in a corporate setting? So I think two parts to that. The first thing is it's always been hard. Change has never been easy. There's a, a quote from Machiavelli, which I'll paraphrase, which is, there is nothing harder um, than somebody who wants to implement change the order of things, he said, and that's a very bad paraphrasing, but it's words to that effect. That was written, you know, 400 and plus years ago. So it's always been hard. Changing people's minds, getting people to adopt something new and move out of their comfort zone is, is a very risky business. So, so the reality is that um, those figures are shocking, but I would have thought the figures a thousand years ago of trying to make true change were probably not much better. However, I think there is something happening which is going slightly awry, is that we are putting the tools and the technology and our own um, thoughts on methodology on a pedestal. And we are kind of consolidating our thoughts around that. And by doing that, we are not concentrating enough on the, the kind of the eternal truths, which is, you know, about setting a vision, about understanding power, about being able to compromise, about courage, about risk. And we've forgotten that actually those are how you drive change. It's not the new tools that we're being sold every day. Those are merely the output. So I think, um, you know, if I look at, you know, change projects I've been involved in um, through, through the years, and luckily not the one I'm involved in now, but, but often it, we've, we've spent too much time thinking about the methodology, thinking about the output rather than the how. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very easy to do because it is exciting what we're doing right now. You know, the, the, the possibilities of technology are, are genuinely endless. But if we glamorize that too much, we're going to forget that actually we need to get back down to basics and lead properly. There is nothing new in leadership. Um, and you're right, you know, there are all sorts of um, thoughts out there that, that leaders need something new now. I, I don't buy it. I think it's always been the same. Yes, it's a different context. You know, we're not, you know, conquering the Roman Empire or, or kind of um, or, um, setting up a, a, a medieval, you know, um, a, a monarchy. But it's, it's the same process as existed back then. 
Interesting. So have you got any view on uh, things that you can learn from sort of an army setup? So you've, you've mentioned the sort of a Roman yeah. Empire. There's been lots of stuff coming through around how the Navy SEALs, um, you, you know, team to deliver outcomes. Even General McChrystal set up a change management group globally really? that's been very successful yeah. based on the hallmarks of how the Navy SEALs, um, you know, deliver in complex environments. I mean, what do you think can we, we can learn from, from those settings? Well, I'm not ex-military or anything, so it's very hard for me to kind of comment in with any any real kind of authority on that. But, you know, I think, you know, many of the great leaders in history are clearly from a military background or have been involved in, in kind of, you know, great kind of um, um, wartime change. And I think um, what what can be learned from that is you need clarity of vision. You don't succeed unless you know where you're going. You have to be able to take risk and really understand the consequences of that risk and are you prepared to take it, you know. If you look at Eisenhower and Churchill deciding um, to land um, in Normandy on D-Day, I mean, that was a, a true calculated risk, which is well understood. And I think, you know, obviously in a, a smaller way that applies to everything we do. You have to be able to compromise. Um, again, Eisenhower, um, possibly, I'm, I'm not a great general, but actually a great politician who understood how to bring together a very disparate team of people who didn't necessarily get on. We take um, Lincoln as well, a very similar position, you know, a great wartime leader. But um, he was able to bring together a, a team of people with very different skills, with internal rivalries, um, to create a, a body which would take forward and win. So that ability to, you know, again, compromise, um, to understand um, risk, to be able to select and build a team, so, you know, talent building in that sense, um, is massively important in history. And I think, you know, my understanding from no expertise is that in a military session, that applies too. Yeah, I mean, teaming's huge in a military setting and yeah. obviously in a corporate setting, any setting, sports, you know, it, 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 the list is endless. So... If we think about that concept of teaming, one of the things you talked about when you did that talk to all of those CXOs uh, a number of months ago was, you know, the concept of, if we're going back in history, how great leaders build a great cabinet to deliver on, you know, an outcome or whatever it might be. So, Tony, with your experience, for your next part of your journey, you're in a greenfield setting. Um, you've got a big transformation you need to deliver for a board. Um, what do you think makes a great change team? So if we could break that down into teaming, skills, attitude, rather than hiring for spec. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's key not to hire exclusively for spec. You need those hard skills, the data guy, the program leadership guy, whatever. Um, but what you really need to do is think about the, the soft skills, so to speak, of that team. So, you know, who is the organiser? Who is the team mum? And that's male or female. It's the person who cares about the team and wants to nurture them. Who is the person who's going to be the visionary? Who's the person who's the driver? Who's the pessimist? Who's the person who's going to say no to everything? Because you need that person. Who's the detailed person? And I think you need to think about in terms of um, creating a dynamic which covers all the major areas and all the major personality types so that you don't miss anything. And crucially, of course, you've got to think about your own strengths and weaknesses and find a team which addresses that so you know i know i have weaknesses and i will go out of my way to hire people who can fill those gaps um i i'm too much of a visionary sometimes um, i'm too energetic sometimes i need people to tell me no um and it's important i have those people in my team and i think again that has applied successful leaders build about them a team which is which contradicts them which challenges them and, and that applies absolutely today. Fantastic. Why do you love doing what you do? Why do I love doing what I'm doing? Um, you see the passion every time I talk to you. You know, like, you love transformation. You love change. I, it's supremely difficult. And, and why does it get you out of bed every day to do it again and again and again and again and again? I like delivering stuff. I like um, convincing people of the need to change. I like um, that uh, light bulb moment you see when people realize the benefits and they're, they're suddenly on board and they're engaged. I mean, it's a gradual process, but at a certain point you kind of see they've got it, we're on board, we're on the same, same train. Um, and I love that. I just love, the, I love that energy um, and I love the successful delivery at the end. It's frustrating as hell sometimes, but yeah. It's the challenge, isn't it? Yeah, it is. People 
keep you going every day, don't they? Because yeah. every day is different. Exactly that. You said something earlier which I really like, which was the eternal truths of change. Yeah. Um, so if we put that in the backdrop of, as change agents, you and I, uh, anyone that might be listening to this, what can we learn from history with a list of the internal truths of change that anyone can bring forward into today's setting? I think... I cannot imagine any successful... or I cannot think of any successful leader that I have read about in history who has not had a clear vision. And I think, you know, there's been some pretty bad visions... You know, um, we've talked about Julius Caesar. I mean, he had a pretty bad vision, right? It was, you know, to become dictator of Rome and, and kill off the Roman Republic. Not a very positive thing. But he was clear. And he really wanted it for himself. So I guess there is... And obviously there are people with very positive visions. You know, LBJ, for example, um, President of America in the 1960s. Not necessarily a nice guy, but he had a really clear vision... Um, and he introduced the Civil Rights Act um, and various other social changes in America, which were positive steps. So I think it's impossible to be a successful leader, let alone change leader, without absolute clarity of vision and real belief and desire to go there. Then, then you have to be aligned with power. There is no point being having a vision and, um, and caring about it unless you have access to power. And... And you access power either yourself, because you have it yourself, or you are a person who is close to it and can influence the power. And you look at um, some of the, the, and the greatest women in history who, per, who perhaps in historical settings did not have immediate access to power. They were able to drive a vision and, and implement change by influencing others. So... Eleanor Aquitaine, um, Eleanor Roosevelt um, are two classic examples. They knew how to align themselves with power and influence through that. So that's the second. You need a vision, you need access to power. You need the ability to compromise as well. Um, and so we see that every day in our own businesses, right? You don't always get what you want. And I think if you hang on too much to what you want and your ideal, you're going to get nowhere. You have to compromise. And again, throughout history, the great leaders have kind of known how to kind of find a path through and maintain the clarity of vision, but understand that um, they're not going to get everything they want. And, and, and usually 70, 80 percent is good enough. And we need to do that as well. We need to really think about our ability to compromise and, and, and promote it as a skill. And then lastly, as I've said, you know, um, understanding risk in a true way, not in an artificial way in the sense it's in a log. It's what risk are we taking? What could go wrong? What are the consequences for me? And what are the consequences for my company? What are the consequences for my team? And being able to evaluate that properly um, rather than in an academic sense. I think those are, the, those are the key. There are others around, you know, obviously around um, talent management, um, and persuasion, etc., and courage, which are wrapped around that. But I think there are some. There's four or five fundamentals there. Quite interesting. You're sort of aligning yourself to power. So pra- practically, when you go into a new organisation, how does that come to life? How would you? Is that? Is, I mean, so if you think about, you know, you as a change agent going into a new setting, is that like one of the the, the first things you'll look at in your first ninety days? Where is the power? Where is the influence? How do I tap into that in yeah. a positive way? Yeah, there's no point running a change program um, if you aren't tapped into power and you aren't aligned to it. And I've been in that situation before um, where actually there is a, um, a great idea and, and a, an upswell around a vision, but actually it's not aligned to power. The, the management team are not united around it. Or there's key people in there who have real power who do not want it to happen. It's also key to think that actually sometimes the power is not where you think it is. You might have a a group of senior people who claim they have the power and are in positions of leadership, but actually the power sits in a different place in the organisation, maybe in a a group of the old guard, so to speak, in an organisation or in a a sales team or something, which are the the arbiters of a company's culture. And sometimes the power does not always lie in obvious places. And it's going to be impossible to get anything done unless you have that power on your side or your 
or you are part of it yourself? So we're looking, surmising this, the, the eternal truths of driving and delivering effective change. So we've got clear vision, access and aligning to power, three, uh, two, number two. Number three, the ability to compromise. Number four, understanding risk. And then five, it's that kind of talent piece. Yeah. You know, persuasion, courage, man yeah. managing people to be durable over a period of time, all those kind of good things. If you look at that in a context, and I love that as a summary, and you put that next to a stat of 84% of transformations fail, do, do you think um, one of the reasons those stats exist is because those five things aren't, aren't managed or, or, or harnessed or adopted in the right way no absolutely yes i completely agree with that i think um i would contest that's the main reason any transformation or any change fails is because people have not properly addressed those things and they have become enamored with the glamour of the hype of the digital age the ego and the ego the the buzz um the the white papers, the adverts, the talks we've all been through, the emails that drop in our inbox, you know, talking about, you know, AI led transformation or, you know, agile led transformation or digital led transformation and all these words, all the trans and the word transformation itself, we've become enamored with that. And we've forgotten the basic core principles of leadership. Um, and these aren't principles of change leadership, they're just principles of leadership. And I think we would all do well just to take a step back and think about those. And then once we've established that and we've understood the principles of leadership, then we can work out, okay, well, how do we use technology in that? How do we use digital in that? How does that apply to our modern world? Um, but you're right, yeah, I think we, we often fail because we forget the real fundamental age-old eternal principles. Uh, I've got a question for you, Tony. Um, Go on. Last 20 years, maybe the last 10 years, a few words to talk about. The word transformation. Great word. What's your view on it? And uh, whether it should still exist? I mean, um, yeah, it should probably still exist. I'm not going to remove it from the English dictionary, but I'm not really sure how much worth it has as a concept um, anymore. It, it's... It's almost like a, a label which makes something more expensive and more complex and more glamorous. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, you, you know, leadership is just leadership, whether it's change, transformation, or running the you know, business as usual business. Everything's about change. Everything's about influencing people. And um, creating this discipline of transformation um, seems to... Um, in many ways exacerbate the problem of people ignoring what good leadership is because it it's created a an industry and um well yeah an industry a, a transformation industry well, it's just leadership there's nothing yep. there's nothing new about it yeah it's an interesting one it's uh, almost fatigues the organization the minute it gets announced yeah the word transformation just and everyone calls everything a transformation at the moment yeah which it, i just struggle to understand you know, yeah i mean de desktop upgrade transformation yeah like, yeah oh, and the, really yeah and the number of again kind of emails you get through you know um, telling you how to do transformation well, really I, I don't buy it mm. I think there's a there's a number of words um, like that we need to be um, careful of I think transformation is one the other one I can't stand is digital <laughs> okay talk to us about that I mean we seem to use the word digital in the way that my 16 year old daughter uses the word like which is like a you know a meaningless filler between other meaningless sentences it, it has no value. Uh, I think it's been entirely demeaned. I, uh, I think, again, we, we have created a, an industry and a whole kind of ethos around a bunch of words and a bunch of methodologies which has clouded us, us to the truth. Yep. And again, those fundamentals, nothing's changed. Being a good leader, the human mind has not changed in thousands of years. So leadership has not changed. The tools have changed, and, and hopefully the, the outcomes and the, and the purpose is, is better than some of the, the ancient leaders. But the tools you use to do it, it's the same levers you pull. Agile. Yeah. <laughs> now, okay, so, so, I mean, having said everything I've just said, I'm, a, I'm actually quite a big fan of Agile. I, I, 
I like the methodology. I I completely subscribe that actually doing something in agile fashion is um, usually quicker, simpler, um, more customer centric, and delivers a better outcome. So, I I buy agile. Um, I'm a fan, but it's a tool. It's no different to to any other tool. Um, to be a good agile leader, you need a vision. You need um, some courage. You need to get a good team together in the same way that any any ancient leader or leader from, from the Second World War or from the American Civil War or the American Civil Rights Movement, you still needed a good team. Nothing's changed there. The, the fundamental skills to implement a good agile organization haven't changed. Agreed. Can I get your opinion on something else as well? I mean, one of the reasons I set Solomon and Stanley up was because, you know, I could see that this change problem was uh, a, a real thing that needed to be addressed in, in, in the corporate setting um, and that your different routes to capability, you know, sort of management consultancies and the sort of contract recruitment market wasn't solving the problem either. And, and I suppose the thing that still frustrates slightly is, and not slightly, actually does frustrate is, some organisations still treat change as a commodity, and I'm, and I'm, I'm struggling to find why they do that. And it'd be, it'd, be, it'd be interesting to get your opinion on it. I mean, I still have mine, but I'd be interested to get your opinion on why change in certain industries is still seen as a commodity, even though we've had a backdrop of the pandemic this year, uh, digital disruption, hyper disruption, um, you know, the industrial era starting to collide with, with you know, new technology coming through, and just basically more organisations being a lot more nimble. Um, why, why are some big corporates still treating change as a commodity or still outsourcing outsourcing it to, to, to larger players? So what do you mean by a commodity in that context? So what I mean by stuff, um, you, you know, um, bringing in a change capability from a yeah. series of contractors on three, four, five hundred pounds a day, yeah. you know, change communications being the last thing that they address, you know, those kind of things. Yeah. The board not taking it as seriously as, as they should do. I mean, my personal view is you're not just in the business of, you know, general insurance, retail, uh, tel telecoms, whatever it might be. You're also a change business. And, and it just still, um, I suppose, uh, bemuses me that you know, people aren't looking at it as an inherent capability that they have to have internally as a competitive advantage. Yeah, I think it's a good point. I think... I think probably because it's easier. I think it requires um, less intellectual engagement and less emotional engagement as well. Um, if you think of change as, as just a building block, as a series of tools that you implement, and once you've done it, your business has changed, then actually, it's actually, it's intellectually quite comforting. It's very simple. It's fast. You can put it in a box. You know, okay, if I engage X consultancy, um, they will put in place a digital transformation program and in 12 months it'll be done and I'll be changed. And it, if you haven't got much time, particularly at an executive level, to think about this, and you've got a bit of money, you can you know, throw X amount of millions at it and right, okay, by a certain date, it'll be done. It's simple, it's easy, it's, it feels low risk. Um, the harder thing to do is to really engage and really think, okay, well, Implementing a bunch of tools is not going to transform my business. To transform my business, I need to change myself. I need to change the culture of my organization, the structure, the way people think. Um, I need to um, change my hiring. I need to change you know, my product set. I need to really think about me as an individual, as a leader, my team, and the whole concept of my business. That's really, really hard and really tiring, intellectually tiring. And I think people just think, I just want to run my business and on the side we can change. Obviously you can't. We both know that's not possible. Um, so I think there's an element of, um, I wouldn't call it laziness, I, think, I don't think that's fair. I think it's wanting to put something in a box and want things to be simple. And there's that human tendency as well to want to hang on to hard, fast things, you know, a thing. You know, if I put in place this web platform, if I put in place you know, this CRM, I would have changed. It, it's hard, fast, it's a thing, it has a date and it has a price. Um, when the real change is to change the people. Yep. And um, that's harder. And that's what we need to focus on. Final question for you. Um, 
really enjoyed the talk. It's been great. I love the fact that we've been dipping back in history, talking about the eternal truths of change. We're really talking about good leadership um, today. Yeah. What's the best bit of advice you've ever been given by um, you know, a previous boss, previous mentor, family member, whatever it is that's really helped shape you to be the leader that you are today that you could share with our listeners? Um, that's a tough one. Um, Feel free to name a few if you've got them. I mean, it's a real tough one. I think there's a bunch of stuff. I mean, there's one ex-colleague of mine who told me, you know, never go f faster than your sponsor. So never create a vision which is bigger or bolder than the business can support, which I think is a really good piece of advice, which, uh, you know, I probably learned the hard way um, a couple of times. I think um, the need to have um, clarity of, of vision is, again, something I've been taught and, and seen um, again and again. But I think the one that I've um, kind of learnt, I've been taught, but probably absorbed more recently, particularly during this period, is um, caring for your team yep. and concentrating on your people. Um, you can't fake it. You've actually got to care for people. You've got to mean it. And um, when you do look after people and you um, create the right team, it's just things work better it's more yep. fun and you get stuff done so I think um, that's probably the one I've absorbed and understood more kind of fundamentally than before is the the importance of caring about people what a great way to end the podcast great to have you on the show Tony very much enjoyed it thanks thank you great to be here thank you yeah, very much no, brilliant cheers